Well, you can ask Pastor Michelle or Len or Bill, and they'll tell you, this morning has not been smooth for me. (laughs) Ah, well, we'll try it from memory. I walked into the hospital ward that day, back when I was in a chaplaincy at, at Duke, and all I saw on the chart was 19-year-old boy, man, male, suffered a hangman's break, hyoid bone in his neck from an auto accident. And as I walked in, there he was. He had uh, a square metallic brace on his head, almost like a, uh, those deep sea divers that put on the big helmets, the metallic ones with a little window or an astronaut's helmet, that's the size of it. And it was steel rods keeping his neck immobile so that it could heal. We'll call him Jimmy. I came and pulled up a chair next to Jimmy. And I said, how are you doing today? And Jimmy just sat there kind of quiet. And I said, what brings you into the hospital? And he reached over to the table and showed me this picture of his car. The only way I knew it was a car was because there was a tire at the top of it. It looked like it had already been compacted. I said, how did this happen? I was high. I was drunk. I ran into a wall. And this is what's left of my car. He said, uh, I've been here eight days. And this is so painful, but also withdrawal. I'm having some good moments and some bad. I said, Jimmy, you got any family here? Mom, dad, anybody come to see you? He said, my mom came here two days ago. She brought me this picture. I said, do you live with your parents still? Or are you out on your own? Are you at school? He said, no. I've been keeping in touch with my mom over the years, but that's the first time I've seen her since I was 15, four years ago. She's always encouraging me. She's always trying to help me. But... Whenever I ask if I should come home, she says, no, your dad, it's just not, he's not ready, Jimmy. And then the tears start to come. He said, when I was 15, I took my first joint and I started to use. Then it came more serious. And the more I used, the more I stole from my folks. I took stuff from my mom's purse. I took stuff from my dad's nightstand. And I'd lie, I wouldn't go home. I started hanging out with a bad crowd. And just before my 15th birthday, my dad packed all my stuff, put it on the front doorstep and said, get get the heck out. Don't ever let me see your face again. I haven't talked to my father since. He said, I should be dead. I wish I were dead. For the first time in my life, in the last four years I've been clean, I've been thinking, what else has he got to do in a hospital bed for eight days but be in pain and think? And he said, I've just hurt so many people, everybody I've loved. I don't want this to be my life anymore. And I sat there and I opened to Luke 15 and I read the story of the prodigal son there to Jimmy. And I remember Jimmy looked at me intensely after I read that story, the father waiting for his son to come home. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor, do you think my dad would take me home? would welcome me back? Do you think I should go home? How about you? 
in this 40-day season of Lent? Are there places in your life, in your family, maybe it's with a brother or sister, maybe it's a mother or father, a son or a daughter, a grandson or a granddaughter, and the relationship between you and they is a struggle, or maybe you see it between two family members you love, and you get along with them both, you're kind of the glue, but they are like fire and ice. Everybody's tension goes up when they get together or you and they get together at a family gathering. The story of Cain and Abel is one of brother rivalry, one of jealousy when Cain resents God's favor for his brother. It's a lot of interpretations over why God seems to favor Abel's over Cain's, but God encourages Cain if he does right. So the implication is that some, something about Cain's offering has lacked either genuine heart. It makes very specific mention that Abel's uh, offering is from the first of his lambs, so he's giving the thing he depends upon. He doesn't know if a second will come, but he's giving what he has, and yet Cain just gives of what he's got in total. But the Bible is littered with family matters. When we get behind the the holiness that we look at the biblical text with and the ways we venerate or look up to Abraham, Noah, and Isaac, and Jacob, and all the patriarchs, and Peter, and James, and John, and Mary, and Martha. When you get down to it, Abram takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah because God tells him to sacrifice his son. After he lifts that knife to his son, the next time Isaac is with his father, does anybody know? At his graveside. He moves away. And then we got great family dynamics between Jacob and Esau. I mean, these two brothers... We know that uh, Abraham and Isaac, their father, loves his son Esau. Man, he's a man's man. I picture the Marlboro man with his cowboy stuff on out and riding on the range. He loves this guy. He's a big, burly, hairy guy, hunter, fisher. Oh, and then there's Jacob. What about your other boy, Jacob? Ah, he's at home with his mother. Oh, but his mother loves Jacob. Jacob, come here. Let me work with you on this plan I got Your dad's about to give the blessing to your brother Esau, but we're not going to let that happen, are we? Team mom boy, let's go. And then, of course, Jacob learns this great lesson. All the hurt he's caused to Esau and his father and his mother, he has to move away from this mother he loves because he's, he's duped his brother out of his birthright, his blessing. So obviously he knows what a good role model versus a bad role model is as a dad, right? So he's going to learn from this. So, oh, Joseph, my Joseph, let me give you this coat, this special coat. Now, we call it a coat of many colors, but it's a coat of long sleeves. Long sleeves because, hey, Joseph, my boy Joseph, he's in management material. He's not going to have to work. Hey, you 11 over here, you guys get out, get hustling. Come on, family quota. Joseph, Joseph, why don't you go out and check on your brothers? Make sure they're working hard. Come back and tell me how they're doing. Of course, Jacob learned a great family lesson about how to not play favorites. We've got Rachel and Leah, two sisters, in this fertility contest. One of them can't have children. The other is having children hand over foot. Jealousy. Mary and Martha, hey, Lord, tell my sister, get in the kitchen and help me out. No, the Bible doesn't ever talk about family dysfunctions. Because it doesn't ever talk about human beings, right? Of course it does. Again and again, the difficult places between these texts we love that we so often read is the pain between family members. The estrangement, the distance, the feeling that I'll never measure up to my brother, to my sister, that I'm always fighting for dad's approval, that I've never heard him say, 
I'm proud of you. I love you. Now, thank God all this stuff is 2,000, 4,000 years old, and none of us have to deal with this in our day-to-day living. But how about you this Lent? How about you this Lent? Is it coming home in your life, in your heart? You know, I, I think for me, so oftentimes, people ask me about my family. I think about my immediate family, great relationships. But then when they really ask me about my family, I kind of kind of misdirect and go in a different direction because my extended family, lots of pain, lots of dysfunction, lots of people not talking to each other. Every marriage between anybody I've loved, every aunt and uncle, my parents, divorce, all of them. Suicide. Abuse. Addictions. Ah, but that's not really my life. Yeah, it's part of me too. So how do we enter into those places as Paul talks about, if we are to be those who have been given this gift of a ministry of reconciliation, if we are to be ambassadors of Christ, not just in church, not just in this place, but in our workplace, in our school life, with our friends, when we're out having fun, with our families, even those we struggle to be family with. Ernest Hemingway writes in his short story, The Capital of the World. Most of Hemingway's stories are about young protagonist guys seeking approval, trying to find their way as men. So in this story, Paco is a young boy who aspires to be a bullfighter, a matador. And he and his father have a falling out in their small hometown. Paco runs away from his father and every family responsibilities has, and the two are estranged, they don't talk, as Paco seeks this thrilling new life in Madrid to be a bullfighter in front of great crowds, insisting that he'll never cower, he'll never be afraid. Again, kind of this machismo, a man's man, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. And there's a scene in the story where the boy's father, after years of searching for a son, not knowing where he's gone, goes to Madrid, and takes an ad out in the paper. And it says, Dear Paco, I'm staying at the Hotel Montana. Montoya, sorry. Meet me on Tuesday at 12 noon. All is forgiven. Your Papa. Boy's father arrives early on Tuesday, waits around in the lobby of the Hotel Montoya, And as he steps out, as the the bell tower in Madrid Square starts to chime, he looks out of this hotel lobby, and there are 800 young men. Paco, common name, like John Smith in England. All seeking reconciliation with their dads. So I wonder this Lenten journey, if for many of us, maybe the first step is to consider where it's really close to home in our families. What does reconciliation look like? That psalm that Mark read talked about confessing our transgressions, the things that we've done wrong, owning the things that we've made mistakes of and saying we're sorry but also not being so stubborn like a horse or a mule that has to be led somewhere that in the grace of God, we could change. Now, I want to be real clear because anytime I talk about forgiveness or reconciliation, I want to also speak to this. Sometimes there's a family member or a friend or somebody or even an enemy that we are trying to reconcile to that wants no part of us. We might be trying to give peace, but they don't, they don't care or that is still caught in a cycle of addiction or abuse and they haven't changed. 
seeking to do our part, as Paul says, to do as best as we can to live at peace and harmony with one another does not mean these two things. Forgiveness and reconciliation is not spiritual amnesia. It doesn't say the hurt that you've done to me, if they are the perpetrator, the abuse, whatever it is that you've done, whatever sinful behavior, that it was okay, that's all right, just forget about it, forget about it, it didn't happen. No. It names a transgression. This is what you did. This is how you wounded me, or this is how I've hurt you. It remembers it, but it says, I'm not going to let that have power anymore in my life. That's not going to be the only thing that I see when I see you. I'm going to try to see you as God sees you. Remember what Mark read? We regard no one anymore from a human-only point of view, but we see as Christ sees that person. One of you brought up to me this morning the book, The Shack. This wasn't planned in the sermon. If I had been reading it, it would have been in there. But in the book, The Shack, in the movie, if you haven't seen the book, a terrible tragedy happens to the main character, Mac. Mac. And the person who's perpetrated to this, he's not known, but they've taken something very precious in his life and wounded him to the core. They've changed his life fundamentally forever. And he's only been able, he can't get past the thing they've done, not only with that person, but just in general in his life. He's just bitter, he's angry, he's resentful, he wants nothing to do with God, and he's pulled back from all his relationships. But in this season of reconciling his past, the Holy Spirit leads him into his spiritual place of his garden. And she shows him the fullness of the person's life who did this to him. She shows him how God sees the person who hurt him. She shows him how God views all the people in his life And for the first time, he sees differently the situation that affected him. And he's able to move forward. Not close to the person who did the thing to him. Not saying, oh, it never happened. In fact, still loathing the thing that was done, but finding a way forward in the peace of Christ because God was at the heart of it. This idea of being reconciled. My brothers and sisters, I would argue that at this time in life of the church, where people are quick to name call, where people are really quick to label, this is how you think, this is how you vote, these are the kind of people you are. These broad brush statements, we do this in our families too, that the work of reconciliation, confession and reconciliation, are more vital to us as a body of Christ and to the world than they've ever been. To be bridge builders, to try to bring people and their differences together and find a way forward. As I sat by that hospital bed, Jimmy said, my whole life, I've been trying to measure up to my older brothers. My whole life, I've been trying to get my dad's attention. He has never told me once he's proud of me. I can't remember my dad ever hugging me, kissing me, and he sure has never told me that he's loved me. And the next day when I saw Jimmy, he said, you know, I talked to my mom I told her the story you told me about the boy and his father coming home, that Bible story you read. And I said, Mom, I'd like to come home. And she looked at me worried, said, I don't know if that's a good idea, Jimmy. And he asked me again, do you think my dad will have me back? I want to go home. How many of us want to find that place of peace? In a minute, we're going to come to the table. And in Matthew's gospel, Christ says, when you come to the table to offer your gifts, 
if you remember you've got something against your brother or sister, if you remember some pain that you've caused or that you're still holding against them, anybody remember what it says? Before you offer your gift, first seek to be reconciled to your brother and sister. This matters, but the substance of healing at this table, the grace that we seek, is a grace we're called to live into. I know what I'm asking and what I'm talking about today is really hard because it took me almost 12 years to forgive somebody in my family who had wounded me. 12 years. It's not something you just say, oh, well, I'm gonna walk out of church today and I'm gonna make this right. Maybe, but maybe it's gonna take a lot more time and prayer and help from God. Don't do this lifting alone. But as we enter this Lenten journey, I'd ask, where is it that the ministry of reconciliation in our lives needs to begin? Are you willing to take that journey? With Christ. Amen.